It's my great pleasure to present our joint work with Tram Huang, Anton Chunov, and Leo Lampropoulos. Sadly, none of them were able to make it here. So I'm going to talk about uh, our experiment with applying property-based testing to a language layer in an industrial-grade blockchain system, and this is an experience report. What is a blockchain? This is a question that I'm not going to answer in this talk. If you've been around for the last five years, you could have noticed an explosion of blockchain consensus systems of different levels of expressivity, or even if you decided to ignore this area whatsoever, but you were showing up at ICFP, you still know what a blockchain is and how it is a cool thing for functional programming. So the question that I'm going to focus on is how do we do programming for blockchain and what good and bad things can happen out of it. So it turns out that if you want to have your functional or imperative code replicated using blockchain consensus protocol, it's actually pretty easy to organize. You just package your code as a module with a state and a function into a module which is usually called a smart contract. And then you make a proposal to the quorum in the system in the form of a transaction. And indeed, before you propose this code to be massively replicated, you do your diligence, you run the parser, you make sure that the program parses, and then you do the type checking, and you also make sure that this is the case. And what's most important, you also allocate some amount of virtual currency, typically associated with the system, just to compensate other parties who will be replicating the same process of validation, just to double check that you are not proposing something bogus, before your code is replicated and uh, propagated to the system, after which every participant in the consensus protocol has a copy of your code and also has a copy of the state. Another question is how we are going to evolve the state and how we are going to use the code that is already deployed on the blockchain. And that also turns out to be relatively straightforward. So one thing that you need to do is to identify the smart contract, the module that you are going to interact with. Then you are going to identify the function and the arguments that you are going to call. And then you are going to form a message which again, comes with some money attached to that. Uh, all that makes it into a transaction, after which this message uh, containing the directives for the uh, language interpreter runs to this interpreter, and if it passes the validation and the interpreter uh, gives a new state, the same process repeats with all the involved parties just to validate that you are not proposing something bad, after which the changes are being replicated in the system and the state is being consistently updated. And the reason why you need to attach some currency to that is just to make sure that you don't waste other people's resources. So that's why you are paying upfront, and some of them are going to get these uh, funds as a reward in one way or another. So the question is, what can possibly go wrong with this setup? As you're probably aware, many things, but uh, let's focus on the bugs that are not the part of smart contracts themselves but happen to be introduced in the language layer. And I'm going to give you three particular scenarios of how things can go very, very badly using my favorite characters from Futurama, Emmy, Lila, and Professor Fansfeld. In the first scenario, Emmy decides to score some funds, and she does it in a very fashionable way by making a decentralized crowdfunding campaign. So in this campaign, the most important function is the one that will allow Emmy to withdraw the donations. And as a part of the validation, in the function withdraw donation, Amy is going to make sure that all the backers have submitted valid accounts so she can take note of them and probably thank them properly. So Amy knows that the type soundness guarantees provided by the language of the blockchain says that if the code type checks and there are no explicit exceptions in it, then it will draw no exceptions. Turns out Amy is wrong in this judgment because an embedded function account to address in fact can throw an exception. And uh, in fact, it happens if B is ill-formed. So contrary to her expectation, if B is ill-formed, uh, not the non-branch will be taken, but rather uh, the exception will be thrown. And this is certainly not a scenario she expects, and in her reasoning that uh, if a type checks, then it's exception-free, she is wrong. Let's see what can possibly go wrong out of that problem. So once Amy has written her contract and deployed it on the blockchain, she has no way to take it back because the contract and its state has been, have been massively replicated. After that, if she's lucky, she started to get some donations. But at the point she decides to exercise her mighty campaign and withdraw the donation back, the bad thing happens if at least one of the donators submitted the wrong data, so the exception is strong, and the contract blocks this money forever. So neither the backers can get it back if the contract is structured in a certain way, neither Amy can enjoy her cash. So this is a certainly not a great scenario. Let's see what else can go wrong at the level of language infrastructure. So now we are focusing on Lila, who is a language engineer. And Lila is in charge of maintaining the reference interpreter for the language that gives the logic to smart contracts deployed on the blockchain. 
Following the suggestions by the users, Amy decides to, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Lila decides to add uh, the operation for computing the power of a certain field, a certain base for a certain argument. And true implementation is perfectly correct. The only problem is that it takes linear time in the size of the argument to compute the power of a number. And remember, this is a computation that is going to be validated by multiple parties, not just the one who deploys uh, the corresponding transaction. The problem with Lila's code is that it disproportionately charges too little of cash for uh, computing the power function. Where the cost is linear, the implementation only charge the logarithmic cost. Let's see what can go wrong now. So now, when this, is an interpreter, uh, this interpreter is a part of the client for the blockchain consensus, uh, we have a discrepancy. Uh, the fact that transactions that have to do with computing the power uh, of a number are very cheap to propose in terms of the uh, funds that need to be allocated for them, but they are quite expensive to execute in terms of the real computing resources. And it doesn't take long for someone to recognize that fact after they will blow the system with cheap messages to cause congestion, conge congestion and eventually denial of service. And denial of services is a real bane in blockchains. This is something that you want to avoid by all the costs and particularly unpleasant when they're called caused by the language implementation, not some serious networking issues. Okay, so that was the second scenario. For the third scenario, probably the most exotic one, let's focus on Professor Franz Forth, who decides to solve the performance overhead issues in a rather a radical way by implementing a just-in-time compiler from the code of smart contracts to the native binary. And he succeeds in this mission, given the 10x speedup in transaction processing, so everyone likes uh, Professor's compiler so much that this is, uh, becomes a de facto part of the client and everyone starts using this compiler uh, for every single uh, smart contract being deployed. The only problem is that this compiler is too clever for its own good. So implementing certain optimizations, it hit famous complexity results such as certain control flow analysis taking a cubic time in the size of the program. And again, it doesn't take long for someone to recognize this deficiency and litter the system with the contracts that are very small, but cause the compiler go into expensive optimizations, uh, leading to the congestion and to the denial of service in the system. Okay. Now we have seen three scenarios of uh, rather unpleasant consequences of what I'm going to call language layer bugs. And those are not the bugs in the smart contracts. Those are the bugs in the infrastructure that executes the smart contracts and validates the smart contracts, such as the type checker and the interpreter, uh, such as the misalignment between the cost semantics and the execution and the real execution costs, and finally the bugs in the compiler. Okay, so in this talk and in the rest of it, I'm going to tell about how and what we did we do to catch bugs in the language layer of a real-world blockchain using a technique known as property-based testing. All right, so here's the rest of the talk. Let's go over some components very quickly. First of all, the language. So our setup was focusing on a language which comes from functional programming community. The language is called Scylla. And this is a very small smart contract language which is built uh, based on system F with some extensions. It's intentionally non-Turing complete. It doesn't allow for general recursion, but it has explicitly declared effects. And all the interaction between smart contracts is structured as communication between independent actors. So this is a practically relevant language. It has been adopted by Zilliqa blockchain and there are several thousand contracts written it and many users are using uh, the code written in Stella daily. If you're interested more in the details of the language itself, uh, well, we have an Uxla paper about that. Okay, so just show some nuggets from the language. As I said, so system F is at the heart of it. You can see the usual suspects, such as the type abstraction and the type application. Still also has an Okamo style uh, imperative fragment with reading, writing, mutable state, em emitting events and sending the messages. And the contracts still look, look like that. You don't really have to read it. You can just notice that, well, there is a contract abstraction, uh, there is a contract definition, uh, there are some mutable and mutable fields, and the whole code is structured as transitions that uh, most of the time are, uh, result in sending and receiving messages. So one interesting detail about implementation of Scylla, which is, by the way, done in Okamo, is its interpreter, which written according to best practices in the monadic style. So uh, the, monad, the use of monad here is quite justified. So you can see the Okamo led by notation and the highlighted primitives that encapsulate the treatment of the gas costs and also failure tracking. The reason I'm highlighting that is that this structure of the interpreter will become quite essential for engineering the testing for it. 
Okay, for the testing, we are going to adopt the standard mechanism of uh, property-based testing, which probably doesn't need that much introduction uh, uh, for the ICFP community. Well, you know the usual thing, you write your properties as Boolean functions, you implement the generators that create random inputs and apply the functions until the bug is found. And this is an approach that has been uh, pioneered by John Hughes, who is, I think, is here, and by Kong Klassen, and has been replicated for multiple languages and settings. Okay, so the property-based testing becomes really interesting when we want to test uh, meta properties of the languages, such as uh, the preservation. So the tricky part here is uh, most of these properties, they're really conditioned on certain values. And as you might know, even if we want to test something as simple as the type preservation, we really need to generate the term which is well typed in a certain context. And a stupid solution to that, which has a very little chance to work, is to generate the environment the term and the type, and check if we are lucky to have this term to be well typed with regard to this type, and if not, repeat this process. So this has very little chance of success, and we might end up generating lots of these inputs before we even get into the interesting part of checking the meta property itself. A much more clever solution is to write a generator that first produce well-formed types, and then based on them, produces the terms. And this is a solution that has been uh, studied quite a bit in the last few years, uh, and it's very much recognized to be uh, a non-trivial problem. Some of uh, uh, solutions to that uh, have found instances in the framework such as CSMIT, in the testing framework of GHC thickness analyzer, and more recent work by some of my co-authors who tested non-interference uh, using generating well-formed programs. Okay, so we followed this approach and we decided uh, to adopt one of the state-of-the-art tools for property-based uh, testing that uh, provides good capabilities to generate uh, types and then structure its data, such as uh, program trees that um, uh, satisfy those types. The tool is QuickChick, and Leo Lampopoulos is the co-author of this work. QuickChick has quite a bit, had quite a bit of success in uh, industry and academia, and also used as a teaching material in the Software Foundation series. So one of the reasons that we decided to adopt QuickChick is the fact that it's very useful for generating structured hierarchical data, namely well-formed programs. It also has a, a reasonably good interaction with OCaml, which is a language in which still has been implemented, and also has some advanced features such as fuzzing-based feedback, which sadly we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to play that much uh, before we started to discover uh, interesting bugs. Okay, so this is about the testing framework, so let me just spend a few minutes talking about some interesting gotchas that we uh, have figured out or adopted from the published work when engineering our testing approach to a uh, Scylla language uh, layout. So the first challenge that we have faced is how to generate interesting programs in a fragment of system F. And what makes system F system F are these two typing rules. So one is for the type abstraction, and another is for type applications. So if we want to generate type abstractions based on uh, 4 quantified polymorphic types, well, this is not particularly difficult. We can do it in a recursive matter by first remembering which, um, which type variable we have in our context, and then generating the uh, term for the type tau, which has this variable occurring freely. So that's uh, re relatively easy. Somewhat more interesting is how to generate type applications. So this rule doesn't quite give justice to the problem, so I will, I'm going to rewrite it as this rule. So here our starting point is the type sigma, for which we want to generate a type application. So uh, the main discovery that we have made is uh, to generate these type sigmas. In fact, what we need to generate are the pairs of the types tau and tau prime, such that tau prime replaces uh, occurrence of, variable, of type variable x in the tau. And the technique that we came up with, which in the retrospect is extremely straightforward, when we decide to call it unsubstitution. So uh, the idea is to uh, take the type sigma, traverse it and identify closed syntactic subtypes tau prime of sigma that we are going to abstract over using type variables. So that as simple as it sounds, so it's just a traversal and recording of types. Well, in reality, the algorithm is slightly more tricky because we need to keep track of closedness of the type and also uh, distribute uh, good frequencies so we won't get uh, very boring subtypes like int uh, all the time. Okay, so that was one discovery. The second one has to do with how could we harness the language infrastructure already in place to facilitate its testing. And for that, uh, so the main motivation for that was to test a particular component of uh, Scylla compiler, which uh, implements uh, a control and type flow analysis. So uh, remember in functional languages, the control flow analysis typically over approximates the flow of values to variables, with the main application of that being optimization such as function inlining, and somewhat more exotically, the type flow analysis over approximates the sets of ground types that flow to type variables, with the main application of that being uh, monomorphization. Unsurprisingly, to 
test uh, these both, we need some version of uh, state collection semantics, which shows whether uh, what indeed flows to the type or uh, value variables and runtime is correctly approximated by the analysis. The only problem that we didn't have the collection semantics ready, the only thing we had is our reference interpreter. But here is the, exactly the point when I'm going to remind you that this interpreter has been written in monadic style, and luckily there are some papers published before, uh, some of them by my co-authors and myself, some of them, uh, and there's a long line of work by David DeRais and his co-authors, how to uh, abstract the uh, interpreter over the effects, and some of these effects might as well implement the state collection semantics. So long story short, we didn't have to change much. So we only need to check, uh, take uh, the instance of the monads that we used in our uh, reference interpreter and slightly tweak it so it would record all the states when uh, the interpreter calls up recursively or performs the look. In this way, we have implemented state collection semantics for flows to information simply as yet another monad instance. Okay, now I'm approaching the end, and this is what we are really here for, to hear about the cool bugs that we have discovered. So this is a table that you can check in the paper, and this was the set of bugs uh, as of the moment of camera-ready submission, which has slightly increased since then. So there are some noteworthy uh, specimen here. So these three bugs, for example, you can see they all mention the word exception, and these are the bugs that happen to do with misalignment between the static and dynamic semantics of the primitives, or as I'm going to call them, emi style bugs. We also have two bugs that uh, would lead to denial of service due to the problem in the interpreter itself. So one of them was mentioned in the example, and another one I will show on the next slide. And finally, there was a bug uh, in the compiler which uh, made Front of law take uh, pretty much forever. So we had to do some con conservative rejection for the programs that are going to be compiled. You can also see that some of these uh, bugs are really known. So what we have done, we have taken the previous commits where these bugs have been last reproduced before they got fixed, and we automatically generated programs just to make sure that our framework was would be able to reproduce these bugs. But seven out of 10 bugs were entirely new. So uh, just as a last example, so here's one of the uh, bugs, which in the retrospect is extremely silly and I wonder how uh, the developers missed it in the first place, but this is what is happening here. So here we have a type abstraction with two names of the same uh, type variable used twice. And what happens is that the interpreter, uh, we should really think that the type, that the type of the variable v1 is uh, this uh, v prime. In fact, it decides at runtime due to shadowing that the type of v1 is this v prime, which is closer uh, in terms of the scope. And uh, and runtime, it results to this uh, this uh, variable a having the type by string uh, 32, whereas it's expected to be a polymorphic type that is applied to not. So obviously this program would crash at runtime and it should have been rejected by the type checker in the first place, but it wasn't. All right. I believe this is all time I have left. So to take away from our experience report, something that you might find useful is, well, our experience of testing a realistic language layer of a blockchain based on system F using Quichik as a tool and discovering several critical bugs. This very simple technique of unsubstitution for generating well-typed uh, terms in system F in, uh, involving type instantiation. Uh, the real world usage of the technique of uh, monadic interpreters for implementing collection semantics at testing style analysis and if you want to see all that in action we have an artifact published in Zenodo so feel free to download it and take a look and this is all I have for today thank you so much